and get ready to go. Well, you heard them. We stand to your feet, church family. That's a lot of information, a lot of changes going on here, but we're excited about what God is doing here. We've had a busy week, crazy week. I don't know if you've had some damage to your house with all of the storms that has been uh, just whipping through the whole uh, area here, but um, we pray that we just, you know, be unified through this. Uh, can you just pray real quick with me and just clear your mind for what God has to do today? Lord, we just come before you, Lord. We gather in this place to lift you up, God, to praise you, to give you all the glory because even though there's storms that come, God, you see us through the storms, God, and you are there. You are faithful, Lord. So we just thank you for that today. And we know, Lord, that you are here where two or three are gathered. Lord, you show up, God. You promise to be with us, Lord. And so we just love you. And we just want to declare that today in song and all that we say and do, Father God. So we love you. Let's praise him today. Amen.
the one who saved my life. Oh, praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. You just give him praise this morning as we just continue to worship him today. In the name of Jesus.
Amen. We thank you, Lord. You can be seated. John 6. Jesus was feeding the 5,000. He had performed miracles. He'd walked on the water. And in John 6, he said, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And they ask, what must we do? What does God require of us? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. In verse 32, Jesus also says, or actually let me just, Scroll down to verse 35. Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, and you have seen me, but yet you still don't believe. All those the Father gives me the will to come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And as we, as we prepare this morning to take communion, we have uh, the elements uh, up front on the side, some in the back. And before I pray, take those elements. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the bread, the body that was broken for us. Reflect on where you are, where God wants you to be today, what he's calling you to do. If he's calling you to repentance, if he's calling you to a work for him, let's be open this morning to hear from him as we come. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your will be done, your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. God, you gave us the guide to prayer. And as we lift you up, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, you want us to declare your praises as we come before you, Lord. Before we lay down the needs that we have, before uh, the brokenness, Lord, that we have, Lord, you call us to lift your name high, God. God, as we come, Lord. Would you just bless this time in every person's life? God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can come.
declares, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Run! 
set us free. Thank you. I just want to know what they were just singing about. Some of you have been in the deep. And it's not been very long ago. It's not been very long ago that you were in the deep. And he came and he got you and he led you out. And you sat down a little bit too quick. I'm just saying. If you have been through the deep, when we go back through this <laughs> and we get to that part, you better be thankful. You better be thankful. And let me talk to the dudes for just a second, guys. Listen, there is, we think we can buck up. But what we need to know is there is a God that's fighting for us more than we could ever fight for ourselves. And that if you want to protect your family, if you want to be the guy that's going to buck up and say, not my family, you better do it on your knees. You better go to the God who will take you through the deep, take you out of wherever you've been, and take you to someplace new and special that probably some of you here today can't even imagine is possible. But I'm telling you, that's the God that will bring you back out of whatever Egypt you're finding yourself in. We're going to talk about a guy today named Moses who led the people out of Egypt, but he didn't lead them out. He just followed God's leading and he got them out. Where do you need to follow God's leading right now? Let's get back. Let's get that chorus. God for the people that are in this room right now, the men, the women, the students, the children that have been through stuff and you have led them out. And for those that are still in the midst of their own stuff right now, would you open their hearts right now? Would you speak into broken hearts? Would you feel brokenness and lead them out as only you can do? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Man. This is going to be, this, this series is going to be epic. God's doing stuff. Now, I do need to tell you a couple things really quick. Because part of, part of sometimes having to be the leader is having to like, I messed up. All right? So if you were in here early enough to watch the early announcements, what, not all of you were in here early? You, you need to be here at 5 till or you're going to miss stuff. All right? I messed up two things on the announcements, all right? First of all, first of all, uh, for parents of elementary students, okay? Parents of elementary students, Superstart is actually March 10th and 11th, not 11th and 12th. I know it's a day, but I don't want to mess you up and you'd be standing up here in the parking lot on Saturday morning. <laughs> Where is everybody? All right? It's 10th and 11th, not 11th and 12th. And Pathways for March is actually uh, March 21st, not March 19th. That's what they, when they let a rookie on the video, that's, that's the kind of stuff that happens, all right? Uh, and man, the Fiesta lunch today, go support our kids. Go support our kids uh, when this is over. They're raising their funds for their trip to Guatemala, which is about four weeks away, uh, and 32 people going down there to change lives, and God's going to use them. And what, what a lot of those 32 that are going, maybe some of them that have been before know, but what a lot of them that are going don't even know is their life's going to be changed just as much, if not more, than the ones they're going to minister to. So uh, go over there as soon as we're done here and support them. Hey, get your cell phone out, especially if you've got a smartphone. Get your smartphone out, all right? <laughs> you never thought you'd hear a preacher say that, but get your smartphone out. All right, uh, because I want to ask you a couple questions. If during the middle of this morning, if you get a 
vibrating call because you have the silence on, right? If you get a vibrating call, all right, and you look down and you see a number without a name, what are you going to do? <laughs> I ain't answering none of those. <laughs> All right, so here's the words of the white hint, hint. All right, if you need to get a hold of me and you don't think I got your number, text me first. Go, hey, this is Joe. I'm getting ready to call you and I'll answer, all right? Otherwise, if it's important, what do we think? If it's important, they'll what? They'll leave a message and then I'll call them back. All right, we got that, all right? Now listen, guys, listen to me. If you look down at the phone, wherever you are, and you see wifey, what are you going to do? You better answer the phone, dude. I'm just saying, all right? I'm just saying, you answer that one, all right? What happens, what happens if you look down and you see a name? I know that person, but I'm not really feeling talking to them right now. <laughs> just not, not right now. I, I can't handle it right now. We're probably going to let it go. We'll get the voicemail. We'll get the text message afterwards. What would you do if that phone buzzes and you look down and it says, God? Some of us, some of us would answer just as quick as we would for a loved one. Some of us would hit decline immediately because we would be terrified of what that call was about. See, we get calls from God all the time on our life. They just don't show up on our smartphone. But you know, you know in here when God is calling you that you need to answer. See, here's the problem we have with talking about calling. A lot of times, it's just been a cultural thing for the last, I don't know how many decades, that when we talk about God's calling on someone's life, we immediately think pastoral ministry. We think about people giving their life, going to Bible college, training, learning how to be a pastoral minister in some form or fashion, and that's all we tend to think about. But God's calling on our life is much broader than that. I want you to listen to this quote from Frederick Buchner. He said this, the place God calls you to is the place where your deepest gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Where your deepest gladness, the thing that make, the thing that gives you the most joy possible, the thing that gives you the most joy possible, when you see that intersecting or colliding with something that you can see in our world needs to be fixed. It's God calling on your life. You see, we've got some people here that have answered that call. I thought of two this week when I was typing this. And not two specific people, but two groups of people. There are some of you in the room today who love kids. Really love kids. And at the same time, at some point in time, you saw how desperately in need our world is for people to spend time with kids, and you became a teacher. So that your love for kids could help what you saw as a massive need in our world. See, your love and the need, they collided at your calling. Some of you in the room today, and there are a whole bunch here Thursday night, some men and women that love serving people and are not afraid to protect people, and they see the craziness that's in our world today, and they give their lives to law enforcement. They, they see a world that's spiraling out of control and they say, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to step up and be in a situation if I need to. And I, and I love people, I love serving. And so they, they give themselves to the law enforcement. So think of that through. Where are the things in your life that you love? That you just like, when I'm doing that, I am just in a sweet spot that I can't, I can't describe to anybody else. I just know it's part of what I was called to do. And, and, and if you can see places where that goes along with where there's a need, you've got a calling. You've got a calling on your life.
And it may not show up on the cell phone as God calling, but you need to understand that. Because here's what God needs. God needs men and women to stand on stages in front of congregations on Sunday. But we get like an hour a week. We get like an hour a week. Remember we did the penny thing a few months ago? Those people that are teaching or law enforcement, all you guys, in whatever you do after this morning, you get far more time with people that you could be called to than a preacher ever does. So what's your calling? What is, your, what is the calling that God has got in your life? See, in, in our current series, Straight Off the Hill, here's the whole point. We're, we're, going to, we're going to eight different mountains between now and Easter. Jason took us to one last week, and we're going one today. We're going to eight different And on every hill, on every mountain, there were lessons to be learned. That the person who was called up the hill needed to learn and take it down straight off the hill and apply it to life. And we're going to learn some things over the next eight weeks that we need to take off of this hill and take it out into the world that we live in and make a difference and let God shine. And so that's why we're calling this through. That's what we're doing. And and we won't forget. We won't forget that God is the one who calls us. And we're going to focus on his call. Like I said, last week, Jason took us up Mount Moriah with Abraham. This week, we're going to climb Mount Sinai with a guy named Moses. The interesting thing, and if you want to get your Bibles out, it's all in the book of Exodus. Between Exodus 19 and actually probably chapter 34, there's eight different times, eight different times that God called Moses to climb up Mount Sinai. All right. Now, some of you have done hiking and mountain climbing. Some of you have heard me tell my story about almost dying on a mountain in Virginia, trying to climb it and get to the top. And those are, you know what that's like. But here's what you need to know. In Moses' day, when there were no paths, there were no roads, to climb from the bottom to the top of Mount Sinai was at minimum a four and a half hour journey straight up straight up to the top. And at least eight different times, sometimes on consecutive days, God called Moses to the top of the mountain. They're going to pop up here on the screen. You might wait to the last one. You can Photoshop them all, whatever, whatever it is you do. But that's Mount Sinai. You can see that we're not talking about like a hill, like our hill up here. We're talking about a mountain. The first time that he calls him up, the first climb is actually in Exodus chapter 19, the very beginning of it. It's shortly after their exodus from Egypt, after God brought them out of Egypt. And he calls Moses up to the top of the Mount Sinai. And he begins to lay out a plan for them, okay? The second trip, the second climb is right after that. It's actually in verse 8. Moses returns to the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai, in order to relay the people's response to God's offer to them. God makes an offer. Moses goes down, talks to the people. Here's what God says we need to do. And then Moses goes back up again to tell God what the people and how they responded to that. The third climb is in verse 10 of Exodus 19. God is speaking to Moses again, which implies that Moses had to climb the mountain again, okay? He had to, that's, that's where he was meeting God at the top of this mountain. The fourth climb, the fourth climb uh, is described in Exodus 19 verses 20 to 25. And God summons Moses to the top of the mountain in order to, uh, in order to have him warn the people not to get too close to the mountain. What Mount Sinai was becoming was an altar in and of itself. It was a place where God was dwelling in a way that he called Moses to be. And he, he, he was teaching reverence. He was saying, you honor this place. Don't, don't, don't just be just going, laying out on the mountain. Don't just be like, this is, a, be careful. Be careful on the mountain. And then the fifth trip. The fifth trip is the one that we all know about. In fact, they've made movies about it. The fifth trip is the one that almost people who've never read the Bible have heard about. Moses going up on the mountain to get those stone tablets. To get, to get that list of 10 that we needed to stay close to. And so God calls him back up and he gives him the commandments. The sixth trip is a few chapters later in Exodus 24, and Moses is summoned to climb uh, Mount Sinai. This time he's supposed to bring Aaron and Aaron's sons um, because they kind of messed up. 
they kind of went against, they actually went against number two uh, before they even really had gotten this done. They made this, they made this idol to worship. And, and while Moses was up on the mountain, but this time when Moses takes his brother and his two nephews up the mountain with him, he says this uh, in Exodus 24, verse 7, he says, we will do everything the Lord has said. We're going to obey. Hey, was there ever a time when you were a kid growing up and your mom and dad set you down and you really didn't want to do something and they said, listen, we're doing this. We're do- School, I know you don't like what the teacher's telling you, but you're doing it. You're doing, you know what I'm saying? You, you had that feeling like, okay, this is the rule and we're doing it. And that's what Moses is telling Aaron and his two sons on this sixth trip up the mountain. This, the seventh trip, Moses goes back up the mountain in Exodus 32 in order to intercede, to pray. God, don't just, don't just wipe them out. Some of them are really trying to do their best. And yeah, there's some knuckleheads down there. And, but don't, don't wipe them out. And Moses goes up back up the mountain to intercede on behalf of the children. And God, like, come on. Don't, don't just annihilate us all. All right? And then the eighth trip is when he goes back up the mountain in Exodus 34 to get the second set of tablets. All right, the, the, second, the second message, if you would. And here's what it says. Is, the Lord says to Moses, God speaking to him, in Exodus 34, verses 1 and 2, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones that I did. All right? And I will write on them with the words that were on the first two tablets. <laughs> I love these next three words. Which you broke. <laughs> it's like, I say, okay, Moses, we're going to do this again one more time. Like, I already did this once, but you, you went down. To, yeah, they screwed, but then you, you threw them down. You broke them, so let's do this again. Be ready in the morning, then come up Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. Moses, you need to come alone. You need to come alone. Man, can you imagine getting that text message from somebody that is in authority over you? And they, the message just simply says, I need to see you in my office alone. <laughs> There's a, <laughs> you got a certain kind of feeling right here, right? <laughs> right there. And God says, Moses, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're to fix what you broke. <laughs> the thing you broke, we're going to do them again. But I need to see you up here. And this time, come alone. Come on. Have you ever felt like you were climbing a mountain over and over and over again and never getting to the top? Have you ever felt like that you were so deep in something that was going on in your life and you were doing everything you could and it just didn't seem like the mountain never ended or that you couldn't get to the top of the mountain? You know, treadmills and stairmasters are wonderful things. They, they, have, they have definite purpose in life, but they don't get you anywhere. You realize that, right? They're, they're just going to keep going as long as you keep walking, but you ain't going nowhere. You're moving a total of four feet. God says, come on. Come on, Moses. And, and let's see when it... But here's the, here's the thing. Eight times up a mountain. Now, they, they put trails on Mount Sinai now. Then instead of four and a half hours, you can actually walk from the bottom to the top in two, two and a half hours now because they've smoothed it out on trails and stuff like that. But not Moses. At four, eight, at least eight times, four and a half hours left the mountain. But here's the deal. If Moses had quit climbing, he would have never received the promise of God. He would have never received the glory of God. He would have never received not only deliverance for himself, but for people that he cared about. And so when you feel like you're climbing like crazy, and, and, and you can't get where you need to get, and, and, and I don't know, your, your spouse, your kids, your whoever's driving, if you want the best for your family, you got to keep climbing. Because if you don't climb to the top, you won't get deliverance for yourself or your family because you'll miss out on the blessing of God. So you just got to keep on climbing over and over again. But there's two of these trips, number five and number eight, that are really important to us because on those trips, we got information. 
Moses brought information that you and I need. And they were chiseled out in stone tablets that looked like these on the screen. Ah, maybe not exactly like them, because they probably weren't in English. But we needed them in English, okay? So let's just really quick, let's review what those Ten Commandments are, okay? The first one, you shall have no other gods before me. No one. You worship nobody but me. What's our world say? Our world in 2023 says, you be your own God. You make the rules. If it works for you, worship that. You be your own God. And so right from the get-go, it's like we've, we've talked about before. If you can get past the first four words in the Bible, in the beginning, God, you're well on your way because you're believing that there is a God. And here, the first commandment is, and don't worship any other gods other than me. But you make, the own, you make your own rules. You be your own God. That's what the world says. Let's keep moving quickly. Don't make an idol or any likeness that you worship. Now, here's what I think. And for, when Moses took that down, they had already made an idol. <laughs> Aaron had already sculpted this golden calf that they were worshiping. So that was a culture that was in the habit of making like statues and idols and things that people, I'm going to go way out on a limb. And I'm going to guess, or at least hope, that none of you are planning on going home today and sculpting an idol. I'm just going to, that's not, that's not us. That's not our world. But I'm also going to guess that everybody in here has some. For a lot of us, we have multiples of the same one, and they're now, instead of sitting on a stand, they're hanging on a wall, and some of them are plasma, and some are 4D, and you get what I'm saying. And we can go home and worship the golden TV for hours at a time. I already ask you to take out one of your idols, that thing we carry around in our pocket that we can't do without. And if we ever, ever, ever took the time to really compare the time we spend on that thing versus the time we spend in this thing, I hope we would be embarrassed. It's crazy. So we've got our own idols. They're just different ones. Our world today, some of you got boats and campers and really cool stuff. And if you're not careful, it can become your idol. And sometimes, sometimes our kids become our own idols. Because if we're not really careful, and guys, we're worse about it than the ladies. Some of us, especially if your kid is an athlete and you wanted to be one, some of us are really guilty of living vicariously through our kids and pushing them to limits that they don't even, they're not even interested in, and they become our idol. Don't have any idols. Number three, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You know, and, and, and we know what that sounds like. Certain phrases that we include God, Lord, Jesus in that are by no means meant to praise or worship, all right? And we know when we say them, and they become, to, to a lot of us, to a lot of us, they become the things that are taboo, and we convince ourselves, as long as I don't say that stuff, everything else is kind of okay. It's just the way we talk today. <laughs> you, know how many, you know how many young adults that I've challenged about the, you know which word I was going, about that word? Oh, that's just how we talk. Well, I don't care. God said don't do it. Because what this really means, this, what this really means is what Jesus took it further and said, be careful about everything that you say. What Paul said when he said, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth except that which is pleasing to the Lord. Now, you think that one through. I need to think that one through. Because sometimes it's not even those words. It's still the things that we say. And if we say, we're not going to let any unwholesome talk come out of it except that which is pleasing to the Lord. Man, I'd like to like rewind my life and put some stuff back in. And so I pray kind of on a regular basis, God, please don't let everything that goes between here come out here. Because not everything is pleasing. 
But that's where it needs to be. Clean up the way we talk. Number four, remember the Sabbath. <laughs> that one went out the window. Some of you are old enough, remember? You, get some of you, you remember when stores couldn't be open on Sunday? Period. Restaurants couldn't be open, period. Alcohol couldn't be served on Sunday, period. Because even people who didn't like go to church or believe, they respected the Sabbath. Well, that's all thrown out the window now. We got to have a day of rest. Now, stay with me here for a minute. Because when Moses gave this, the, the Sabbath was understood to be the last day of the week. Because it was the day that God had worked six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. And so they associated Sabbath with the seventh day. Then we get into the New Testament. Jesus comes and dies for our sins and buried, and he raises from the grave on what day of the week? The first day of the week. And so tradition kind of moved the Sabbath from the last day of the week to the first day of the week. Listen, what God wants you to do is have a day of worship and a day of rest. And if you're truly making Tuesday your Sabbath, we have Thursday night worship. That's part of Sabbath. Because for some people, given some other things in our society, Sunday doesn't, Sunday's not even possible for some. All right? And so they need to find their own Sabbath. Every one of us needs to have a time where we rest and worship God. Where we rest and worship God. Where we rest and draw close to God. All right? Number five, honor your father and mother. When, when Moses gave, when God gave Moses this, every person at the bottom of the hill knew who their father and mother were. How do we live out that commandment in a culture where a lot of kids grow up never knowing who their dad is? Some grow up never knowing who their mom is. Those authority figures that come into our life, those authority figures, sometimes they weren't our biological mom and dad, they were our adopted mom and dad. And you think that's horrible? You know what a, being adopted means? That means not somebody got you, somebody chose you. And so whoever those people are in your life that, that fill the void, you hear the term a lot used, you are a father figure to me. All right? So if a person is a father figure to you, honor them. Honor them. Understand that there are people in this world that actually know more stuff than you do. And you know how they know more stuff than you do? They've lived longer than you have, right? And, and now they get it. And, and now they can see, like, oh man, if you go down that path, that's a dangerous path to go down. And so we need to listen. Now, let's go over here at the top. This is, this is the one that, like, if I give a list of the Ten Commandments and say, okay, check off any of the ones that you've never broken. People love it when they get the number six, because there's not everybody, but there's a lot of people like, yes, I got one. I can put a check mark here. I've got, well, stay with me. Stay with me. Because Jesus said, if you have hatred in your heart to someone, you've murdered them. Now we're looking for the eraser. No. All right? God says, care about people. Care about people. Love people. Don't kill them with your thoughts, with your words, or with your actual actions. Don't murder. Now the next one, if, if six makes everybody feel good, seven's like, oh shoot, here we go. Because we need to understand this. When it gets to thou shalt not commit adultery, listen, let me define adultery. Any form of sex outside of the biblical constraints of marriage, period. Period. Sorry, I didn't chisel that. The elders of our church didn't chisel that, didn't make that up. So what do we do about it? Now the beautiful part of it is, here's the upside of all that. Now the down, let me do the downside. And then we'll do. when, when we got to Jesus, how I know that that means anything, because Jesus said, if you look at someone with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. <laughs> well, if looking at someone 
with those kind of thoughts in my heart is adultery, then anything I do with them if I'm not married to them is adultery, right? But Jesus also came to give us grace. He came to give us grace. And, and Jesus came to say, I don't care where you've been, what you've done, who you've done it with. Stop. Did you get that last part? Stop. Because here's the problem, especially with this one. A lot of us say, well, God will forgive me. Yeah, he'll forgive you if you stop. Because here's what Romans says, shall we go on sinning? Shall we go on because God's going to forgive me? And then Paul answered his own question, heaven forbid, by no means, don't do that. Yeah, I'll forgive you. God says, I'll forgive you of anything other than the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But when you're forgiven, when I take you out of your Egypt, don't go back. So some of you need to do some things this week. <laughs> I'm so proud of some of you in this room. Because some of you in this room had that really uncomfortable talk with the big bald guy. And in a one-on-one -on -one, face to face, he said, yeah, here's what God says, stop. And you went and got a marriage license and got married. Praise God. Praise God. And some of you need to do that this week. And then he says, don't steal. But, but the world says, I want it. I want it. And then he's got four. And so I want that one. Some of us say, yeah, but like when I'm standing at work at the mall in my store and there are so many, there is such a stack of 20s in that cash register, they will never miss three. Or we're in the workroom, we're in the workroom in our place of employment and said, uh, they don't need that. Or we're sitting in class and I can see his answers, or more importantly, I can see hers, because hers are probably right and his probably aren't. I can see her answers. So I'm just going to like, God wouldn't have put it there if he didn't want me to have it. <laughs> That's how we justify, right? And it's still robbing. It's still stealing. That's how not bear false witness. That's how, we can't hardly give people to bear true witness in, in this society. People see things and I don't want to get involved. No, don't ask me. I don't want to get involved. But we got a lot of people who are like, yeah, but if I can get ahead, I'll say anything. I'll make up a story. I'll bear false witness if it puts me ahead of you. God says, don't bear false witness. And the last thing he says, don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Like, I'm friends with a lot of you. I mean, on a social basis, some of you all have got some really cool stuff that I'd love to have. But I've gotten to a place in my life where I love that you have it just as much or even more. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have stuff, but not at the expense of you not having it. Don't covet. Now, stay with me because this is all tough stuff. This is all straight from God, and it's pretty black and white. Uh, don't worship it like it. Don't carve an idol. And then Jesus came and, and, and kind of took it to a new level. Be, and here's why. This is important. Stay with me. There's not a single person in here, not a single one of us, that can fulfill these on our own. We can't. We can't do that on our own. And especially when Jesus took it to another level, beyond just actions to thoughts, we can't do it. We cannot do it on our own. That's why Jesus had to come. And that's why he did come. I want to circle back around to those thoughts uh, from Frederick Bucher. And here was another part of that thought that I didn't read earlier. He went on to say, if you can discern what your greatest joy is and what you believe is pressing need in the world, then will you find where those two intersect, chances are you'll begin to understand God's calling in your life. Before we can understand, really follow the call of God, He has to be not just part of our life, but the driving influence in our life and our decision-making process. And so I ask you, is Jesus really leading your life? Or is 9.30 Sunday morning just a box you need to check to get you Jesus on and feel like you've been here. 
Because we're really good at making excuses. We're really good at making excuses for things that we don't want to do. Moses was good. The guy that got it, he was great at excuses. Because long before this stuff ever happened and God called him and said, hey, Moses, I want you to go lead my people out of Egypt. Moses had excuses by the nines. He, he, said, he said, I'm not good enough. It was a lack of self-worth. And part of his, part of his feeling that way, that he, he wasn't good enough, was he, 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 he couldn't talk clearly. He stuttered. He said, God, you can't use me. I can't even get a sentence out. <laughs> and welcome to Power Grid Issues. All right? <laughs> God said, no problem. We'll take care of that. Hey, Aaron, you go with him. You're pretty good at talking, not necessarily that good at thinking. So let Moses do the thinking, and we'll do that. And then you share the message. Okay? All right. The second excuse that Moses had was, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. Bobby comes up to you and says, hey, I, we, we really need you to facilitate a life group. I can't do that, Bobby. I don't know enough. You don't have to know that much. It's all in here. It's not like you've got to make anything up. It's all in here. And so we learn to gather. But Moses said, I, I don't know enough. And Moses said, I might fail. It was a lack of confidence. A lack of confidence, I might fail. You know many things that never get done because of the fear of failure? You do that in your own personal life? Corporations do that? Let me be really honest with you, churches do that. Churches do that. Sometimes we say, hey, what if we did this? And it's, it's big, it's out there. Like, what if we built a six million dollar building what if we did that oh no 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 people never we never we never fill that place we never fill that place but we got three services and we've grown from the end of february last year to the end of february this year this place of worship has grown by 31 percent now, now, see, like, but but what but listen 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 no no listen what if we hadn't built that what if we, let me do this really quickly. If you have started attending Shelby Christian Church since 2005, raise your hand. If you started, no, you started after 2005. All right, start after, all right. This place was built for you. And this service, that's the lowest percentage of hands we'll see. The other two, it'll be well over 50%. But we could have said, ah, it'll never work. But what if it does? What if it does? Moses like, nah, I don't know. I don't know. Moses said, I can't do anything right. <laughs> we all feel that way at times. I don't have the talent. I can't do that. Uh, we, I don't want to, the lack of desire. But let me finish up with this. We got we to move quick. Let me finish up. So Jesus comes to answer all of our excuses. And then there's that telling moment after his resurrection where they stand in front of Peter who's preached this sermon that got all up in their face and says, you know, you guys prayed for Messiah. He was here and you killed him. And they came to Peter and said, what do we need to do now to be saved? What do we need to do now to be saved? And in the New Testament, here's what, here's what the answer was. You need to trust that Jesus is God in flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh and came and dwelt among us. You need to trust that Jesus is God in flesh. You need to be willing to repent of your sins. This says, some say that I'm, I'm slow, slow to anger. God said, I'm not slow, I'm patient, hoping that everyone would come to repentance because that's the goal. And he says, then you got to confess his name. Anyone confess the name of Jesus, we'll be saved. Like that when you, when that time when we're looking for witnesses and you say, yeah, I want everybody to know that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And then you've been baptized. Because on that day when they asked Peter directly, what do we need to do to be saved? He gave two commands. They're in the command, the, the, the Greek that, that is, we have in Scripture is in the command form. You need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of your life. That's commands, not suggestions. 
You ever had this conversation at your house? A conversation that started one way or the other. Are you even listening to me? Don't raise your hand and especially don't point. I read this this week. A lady wrote, from the, hus- from the kitchen, my husband is telling me that the plumber is coming tomorrow at 3, three o'clock. I don't really hear him, but somehow I still respond, okay. How many times do you think God has been speaking? And all he got was a, hmm, okay. See, what needed to happen here was first thing, what first thing Moses needed to listen to God. The second thing, the people needed to listen to God. And the third thing now is we need to listen to God. We need to listen to God. These things on the mountaintop, these last things from the New Testament about what we need to do to be saved, those aren't suggestions, folks. They're commands. And we need to do them, and we need to get them right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing together. And some of you just need a time to draw back near to God through prayer. We, we, a lot of times we say, hey, why don't you come up here and pray? Well, that's kind of awkward. It's kind of awkward up here in front of everybody. So here's what we've done. Over here at the foot of the cross, we've moved some chairs out. We've got a couple benches over there. There's a place at the foot of the cross that you can go and kneel completely by yourself. Nobody will bother you. You can go sit on them if you can't kneel and just pray. Maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe you need to pray right where you are. But so, I know, I know, I know, I know that some of you here today need to accept Jesus. It's time to quit running and start running to the Father. And if you need to do that today, and you don't know what that looks like, some of our staff, they're not going to bother the people praying over there, but they'll be over here along this wall. They'd love to walk you through that. And and we got three baptisms coming next service, so we'd love to make it four, five, six, or ten. All right? Let's stand. Let's worship, and let's all, in our own way, let's run to the Father. Let's run to the Father as we worship. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created. To let it all go I see it now I'm laying it down And I know that I need it I run to the Father Fall into grace I'm done with the hiding The reason to wait My heart needs a search My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father again and again
will be around. We got other guys who will be around. We'd love to still talk to you. If this is your first time here, please stop at the I'm New Walton lobby. We got a gift for you out there. Ladies, I spoke a lot to the men today. Let me speak to you for just a second. If you want to connect with some other Christian women, we're, our women's ministry is hosting March Mondays that starts tomorrow night out in the common ground, the four Monday nights in March at 6.30 to 8. Different stuff going on. If you find out, want to find out more about it, you can see my wife Kim. She's in the back at the t-shirt table and they're getting low, but don't worry. If they don't have your size back there, stop and let her know what, what your size is and we'll have it by next week, all right? And so we can take care of that. And don't forget the kids and their lunch down there today. Let's get out of here and go love God. Love people and watch him change the world. See you guys.